Come on, some of you, come on. For those of you who may still be hungry, we have some Rudy's breakfast tacos on the way so you can leave this meeting with one in each hand. Come on. We will never, ever do that again. We'll make sure we have plenty of food. You know, I went to a men's event uh, several months ago, and you would not believe this. They had a limit on how many pieces of bacon you could take. And you know what made that limit even worse? It was the women telling us how much bacon we could have at a men's event. Anyways, I was pretty ticked, so we'll make sure that that never, ever happens here. You know, I don't, I don't care what the world says. Uh, you were not made non-binary. You were made binary. Uh, God created them male and female. For those of you who are visiting with us, maybe uh, for the first time at this breakfast, uh, my name's Stephen, and I'm one of the pastors here. I was talking to somebody. I am the founding pastor, which doesn't mean I'm the smartest, but I definitely got here the quickest. Come on, somebody. And so you, you'll know we're, we're really a part of a family of churches. This is an all, uh, really an all-church event, really all-community event, too. You know, we're not going to shove Vintage Church down your throat the entire time. This is a safe place for you. Maybe bring people that you work with, uh, maybe, maybe other people, maybe employees. If you own a business, you can reserve a table, different things uh, like that. We're going to really, uh, Chuck said it perfectly, we're kicking off really a place and a space where you can maybe get to know some other men, maybe share phone numbers, maybe connect with each other. Also kind of a, a place where you can learn how to grow. And, you, know, you know, for me personally, like I, I enjoy different events and I enjoy activities, but how many of you all like you really like a plan, like a plan? Like, give me a path. This is how men think, right? Men think, give me a path and I'll, I'll start walking it. Like, I may, I may take a couple detours. I'm not going to be perfect. But if you give me a path, right, I, I, can, I can get somewhere uh, that I want to go. And that's really what this is going to be. Um, over the next eight months, actually, we're going to be studying uh, through a resource that I wrote. You actually hold it in your hand. That is the ver- those are the first copies. I haven't told anyone else what's going on. We may or may not uh, launch it to the church this next spring. Uh, But it's really a resource because I got frustrated in my personal faith, oh, probably about a decade ago. And I started, there was all of these activities. You know, you you look on, there's all these events. You can go do this, you can go do that. We have church, we have series, we have small groups, we have all of these different things. And I struggled to find a thread or a path uh, to really sustained growth in my life. There were seasons where I'd do really well. And there were seasons where I wouldn't do really well. What happened was I started comparing those two different times. And there were some common denominators or threads uh, that that really, really uh, identified the times I did the best. And then when those were missing, I tended to get worse. And so what you're holding in your hand uh, really is uh, the culmination of that journey. Uh, I, I discovered there were really eight systems Um, of faith. There were eight systems. And when I say faith, as men, we tend to separate church, faith, work, family. When I say faith, I really mean personal growth in every way. I mean, like, how do we grow in a sustained fashion in every environment? You and I tend to compartmentalize our lives. That's just what men do. But how many of you know every other part affects each other? Does that make sense? It's all kind of, we don't like to admit it, but one area of our life does uh, affect another area of our life. And that's really uh, what we did. We're, we, we identified really eight systems of growth. I think I have a slide up here uh, for it. There were eight systems here. We're going to start on system one. These are all kind of standalone too. I think you'll get a lot out of them um, just as you walk. That book actually has some assessments in chapters four and eight. Uh, it actually gives an assessment. Maybe you can tell if you're not very good at one or the other, some things you can do uh, to fix it. But I really believe that when men get stronger, our world gets better. When biblical manhood is elevated, all right, it blesses and protects all that our life is connected to. The biggest issue in the world today is we have accepted an alternative uh, uh, identity, an alternative view of what being a man is. And what this environment's gonna be, I'm just gonna completely shatter that completely. I'm not talking about toxic masculinity where you're trying to control and you always got to be the boss and you're just a big jerk. Remember, the Bible says that the greatest among us, the greatest men among us, right, will get a towel and will wash someone's feet. Obviously, metaphorically, it's kind of gross. Otherwise, they can do it on their own. But you know what I'm saying? We're servants. That's the idea. 
And we're best, our world is best when we know how to serve and we don't apologize for stepping into the role of man. And so we're going to be talking about uh, these eight systems. It's going to be kind of a theme. I also want to encourage you, you know, I think sometimes we can come to an event. We're only going to have one of these once a month. We're going to add a system. They can be standalone. Don't worry about that. We'll be able to post um, all of the content in the study guide. You actually have a study guide. Go ahead and pull it out. Did you know that you're smarter with a pen? Did you know that? You're smarter with a pen. Study after study has said, okay, has proven that you are many, many more times likely, depending on what study you look at, to remember something, to retain something, if you write that something down. And so we're going to have kind of this place and space once a month to do that together. I want to encourage you to take notes. I also want you, before we get started, I want you to pull out your cell phone. Go ahead and pull out your phone. I know. Pull out your phone. You know you got it. Get off Facebook. Come on. I ain't getting on, back on social media until January. I made a commitment. I, I'm going to tell you, it's been the happiest week of my life. I'm just telling you. It really has. All right. Y'all are crazy. Y'all are crazy. Okay. Anyways, so we have these eight systems of faith. We're also starting in November. I'm going to start sending a text um, every single day. This is actually my number. Well, technically it's me and Chuck's number. Okay. It actually goes into a system uh, called community. It's just for this environment. We're actually going to just send daily encouragement scripture to kind of help you keep the content in front of you. Some of those things are going to be, Hey, stop for just a minute. And you know, practice this for a second, or hey, read this scripture, confess this over your life. Others may be, hey, you know what, have you, they may be reminders to maybe put something, you know, at at a higher, a higher priority than maybe you had before. But if you'll text change to that number, you're going to get a reply. I want you to save that as Pastor Stephen. If I'm not your pastor, you can just say Stephen Martin, uh, like Steve Martin. Anybody? If I spell my name with a P-H-E-N. Uh, anytime you have a question, a thought, I literally have this on my phone. One of the reasons I got off social media is so I could actually spend time investing in like real people that are in front of me, you know, that, that actually want to grow instead of people who just want you to agree with them. And so um, I want to encourage you, you can text uh, different things there. Me and Chuck will actually both kind of be receiving those to make sure if one of us are out, you know, uh, you know, if one person falls into a pit, you know, it's a bummer, but if you know, as a friend, you can pull them out, you kind of thing. So uh, you can imagine who's going to be in the pit at what time. I don't know. It could be one or both of us, but uh, we're going to be kind of fielding these. Uh, this is also going to be just a great, a great time where you can kind of, kind of phone, a, phone a pastor, phone a friend, phone another man. Um, we also aren't going to save everybody's contact and all that. And so if maybe you're in here and you're struggling with something, there's a lot of shame surrounding it, no judgment. You can just shoot us a text. We'll We'll, we'll just walk with you, give you some thoughts and, and, uh, and some encouragements there. And so uh, I want to make sure that you have that. So today we're going to jump in to uh, really the very first system, which is the heart. And here's what I want to say. Uh, if I was going to title this message, I would say the heart is, it really is character as a foundation. You know, I think a lot of times we do a lot of things. We build this life, okay, but our foundation isn't strong enough, it isn't deep enough, it isn't wide enough, it isn't reinforced enough to actually carry what we build. And so we build all of this stuff on top, right? But when the storm comes, not if, but when, when something's tested, right? It's not uh, what we built that's tested, it's actually the foundation that it's built on. And the Bible teaches us that this foundation really is your heart. It's this idea that as men, we wanna jump to action, but first we have to make sure right? That our heart is right. And so heart as the foundation of character. I want to say this too. A lot of people, when you say character, it kind of means good. That's not what I'm using it as. Character is you. Did you know it's just you, where you are right now? It doesn't have to be any more or less. The level of your character, what your character, it's you. So it's not good or bad. It's just you. Okay, look what the Apostle Paul says about life and faith in 1 Corinthians 9, 24. He says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one, everyone say one, only one person gets the prize. So run to win. You won't hear that in our world today. They say run so you can get a participation trophy. That's not what God wants for you. God wants you to win. Now, you don't have, just because you win doesn't mean somebody else has to lose. Okay, but God wants you to win in your life. That's just the reality of it. 
And so we want to run to win. That's this idea of character. He says all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that's going to fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. He's alluding to the heart behind what we do and why we do it. So I run with purpose at every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. Look at verse 27. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I'm going to build a life that's going to crumble under the pressure of a storm. I'm paraphrasing. You with me there? All right, so in our life, I think sometimes we think of personal growth as a moment. It's something that happens, you know? If I just had the right circumstance or the right situation, man, I could grow. If I just had the right things lined up, I could grow. The reality is it's not a moment. It's actually thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of moments where we make the next right decision, (laughs) where we do the next right thing. And what he's saying here is our race isn't a sprint, it's actually a marathon. And I don't know if you've ever, any of you runners in here? Any of you in a cult like that? Not the army. You know, I always tell my running friends, I man, I have friends that run marathons. You want to go? I'm like, no, man, I'm good. My soul's good. I don't know what you're running from, but I've already settled that in my heart, okay? But how many of you know you train for a sprint and a marathon completely different? I actually have several friends who do marathons, and if you think like a sprinter and you start a marathon, you can actually die in a lot of situations. In a lot of environments, depending on what the, what the length is, depending on the, the, out, you know, the outside forces, it's not good. And I think a lot of us as men, we just, we just it, I don't think it's just men, I think it's our world. We want it and we want it now. We want it and we want it now, right? We do. And the reality is the things that are gonna actually last, the things that are gonna actually lead to, to lasting change and happiness in our life, they simply don't happen in a microwave. They, they don't happen in a moment, they happen in thousands and thousands of little moments. That's the idea that I'm trying to get here. And you know, I think sometimes we think of growth and did you know even Jesus had to grow? The Bible teaches us even Jesus had to grow. One time he was 12 years old, they were going, him and his parents were in Jerusalem for the Passover, all right? He literally, you know, he's sitting at his feet asking the religious leaders questions. This is the son of God having to learn and practice his intellect. And he's, he's, he's he, matter of fact, he gets so distracted, his parents, you know, they're in a big caravan. They actually leave him, they leave without him, right? They leave without him. A day into their journey back home, they realize they forgot him and they have no idea where he is. By the way, if you've ever felt like a bad dad, you're Okay. My wife yelled from the kitchen, have you seen Grayson? And I'll be honest, no. I, I was supposed to watch him and I didn't. He's like around, like, you know, he's like driving the golf cart. He's like three, he's driving the golf cart into the garage, you know. My, my point is, is like, they literally left their kid, right? They get back, right? I'm sure they had some embarrassment, some shame. Three days later, they, they find, imagine searching for your kid for three days. They find him in the temple, learning, sitting at the feet of these religious leaders. And this is what we read in Luke 2, 49. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know that I would be in my father's house? Uh, Only the son of God can get away talking to his mom and daddy like that, by the way. But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Jerusalem with them and was obedient to them. This is the son of God, their creator. But his mother treasured all these things in his heart. Look what it says about Jesus. And Jesus grew, everyone say grow. He grew. He went through a process. He's 12 years old, and he grew in what? Wisdom and stature, and he grew in favor with God and with man. This is interesting, but everyone around him could tell he was a superstar at age 12. You know what we would have done in our world today? We would have, we would have done a video, put it on YouTube, let him go viral, right? That's what we would have done. That's our natural instinct, man. Let's get there fast. At 12 years old, they knew something was up. I mean, Mary especially, right? Something was up, like there was something special. But then you have 18 years and not a word about him. This happens. He starts his ministry at 30. 18 years pass by. Every 18 years. Developing character is a process that takes time. If it took time with Jesus, it will take time with us too. The reality is we're all in a process. We're not where we want to be, But if we stay committed to the process, we're not where we used to be. Does that make sense? This is very important, especially when we talk to men. We've got to lead this way in our families. We've got to lead this way in our jobs. 
We gotta stop reaching for the quick fix that isn't fixing anything and just put our head down, right? And do the next right thing. The foundation of all personal growth and success is character. I wanna define character for you. Character, for, character. I think this is in your notes, I don't know. Character is defined as the mental and moral qualities distinctive to an individual. It's less about how good or bad you are, and it's more about who you are. What, what, how do you think? What are the qualities that people would use to describe who you are? And you know what the good news is about following Jesus? If you don't really like all of them right now, through the power of the Holy Spirit and through cultivating the right heart in this first system, you actually can change it. You can change it. So here we see 18 years later, Jesus steps out of obscurity and he begins his public ministry. But before, right when he gets out, after this 18 years of preparation, in Matthew chapter four, he's actually led out in the wilderness to be tempted from the devil. And I believe in his temptation, we learn some things uh, that we need to look out for in our own character. Mark, uh, Matthew chapter four, verses one through 11. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. By the way, men make horrible decisions when they're hungry. Just, just putting it out there. And tired, by the way. Really bad time to make a decision when you're hungry or when you're tired. During that time, the devil came and said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of man, jump off. For, you, for, for the scriptures say, I, see, he's, he's tricky now. He knows Jesus knows the scriptures. So now the devil's gonna try to twist the scripture. See what happens? He says, for the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so that you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. But Jesus knew that this was a violation of the character, the idea, the identity of God. So he responds, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said. This was before Jesus would die on the cross and be resurrected. The devil actually had the power then to give everything because Adam gave it to him in the garden. I will give it to you, he said, if only you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. Here's some facts about character from the story we read when Jesus was 12 in Luke 2 and what we read in Matthew 4. On both sides of his development, right? He's 12 and he's 30. We learn some things about character. Matter of fact, I'm going to go through them really fast. I want you to write them down. Um, and, uh, and I want, there are essentially four facts about character. I see some of you are missing a blank. I don't know what it is. What blank do we skip? You can put that up for the guys. I hate missing blanks. Y'all hate missing fill in the blanks. First slide, guys. First slide. First slide with the blank. Do we get it? There we go. Do we get that? Is that the first one? Nope. There's one before that. Process. Just give it to them. All right. <clears throat> All right, so four facts about character. Character takes time to build. He served 21 years as an apprentice to somebody a lot less perfect than him. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. Jesus apprenticed himself to his stepdad, who was a sinful person and man, not as good as him, right? But he still apprenticed himself to him. That's interesting. Next, we see characters best built in hiddenness. There's no mention of miracles or status for 18 years. Nothing. But we see in Mark chapter 4 that character is always tested through temptation. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. Jesus was tempted like you and I are tempted. He understands. He didn't cave like you and I do, but he understands. And finally, character is built on God's word and his ways. Jesus right? Could have done a lot of things, but he, he, he countered the devil with God's word. He countered the lie, if you are the son of God, with the truth of God's word. Here we actually see three tests of character. Uh, this is helpful for us. How many of y'all like frameworks? You kind of like to be able to see the bricks, kind of like to be able to see it. Did you know that all temptation in your life, all of it, all of it comes down to three tests of your character? Every time you fall short, every time you have a decision before you to choose life or death, 
Blessing or curse, right? Right or wrong. It always comes down to these three tests of who you are. And by the way, we're all growing in these. I can tell you, man, I've fallen in some of these like, you know, on the way in. I was a little mean to, the, to Elliot back there. Elliot, I'm sorry. I think that slide was added last minute. It wasn't your fault. I forgot to tell you. My point is we're all growing in this. It's not something we arrive to, but I think knowing and understanding these tests help us, especially as men, because we can go, hey, which one is it? Why, am I, why, why can I not get through this argument with my wife? Why does this same thing keep popping up with my kids? Why does every boss that I work for say the same thing as they're showing me the door? It comes down to three tests of character. We see them in 1 John 2, 16. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Now let's take a look at Adam and Eve, man's first temptation. We see these same three, Genesis 3, 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it's the lust of the flesh, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and the tree to be desired was to make her wise, the pride of life, she took of the fruit thereof and ate it and gave it to her husband as well. A lot of people rag on women in that very first passage, but the reality is Adam was sitting there as the leader watching all of it happen. How many of us as men, let's just be honest, we just, you know what, honey, yeah, we can go to church. You know, honey, yeah, I, I guess we can serve. You know, honey, I really want to stay home and watch the game. Don't worry, you're going to get home in time for the game today, I promise. But we do that, right? We do the same thing Adam did. We just kind of recline back and go, oh, honey, you got this, whatever you want. I'm going to go to work and do my thing, but you know what? You can just, just give away the future of our family, you know, carry the weight of the future of our family. But we see those three temptations. By the way, the temptation we just read about Jesus, the same three are there. Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 through 9. During that time, the devil came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, till these stones to become loaves of bread. Lust of the flesh. He was very hungry. He was very hungry. I bet all those rocks, I've been in this region where he was tempted. Those rocks look like bread. It would have been torture. <laughs> and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you. That's the pride of life. Presume upon God. Then he says, I will give it all to you. Look at all of it if you'll just kneel down and worship me. That's the lust of the eyes. So that's what we're going to talk about as men. Those three things, we see him with Adam, right? John wrote about them. Here, Jesus was tempted with them. Each one of us, the difference between making the right decision and the wrong decision comes down to identifying, right, what, what, our, what our temptation is going to be. The very first one is the lust of the flesh. You can write that down. It involves any type of sinful activity that brings pleasure to the body. This could be sexual sin, which is essentially sexual anything outside of God's boundary. This can be addiction. The Bible teaches us to be mastered by nothing. All things are permissible, right? But, but you shouldn't be mastered by anything. This could be gluttony. This is there. This could be uncontrolled anger. Have you guys driven lately? <laughs> Did you know I lowered my blood pressure by 25 points by staying in the right lane and letting people pass me? Literally, my doctor was literally like, you have really high blood pressure. And Kyla says, yeah, mine goes up with his every time I get in the car with him. <laughs> it works. Last time I went back, man, I lowered it. This next one, lust of the eyes. A strong desire to have something that rightfully belongs to another or something that you haven't earned. Did you know that's sin? To covet something. We don't hear that word a lot. We rarely hear the, the sin of coveting, but it's one of the Ten Commandments, right? It's the Tenth Commandment. Thou shalt not covet. What does that mean? Wanting something that you didn't work for, you didn't earn, and doesn't belong to you. Our whole world does that. <laughs> we want that promotion even though we can't even do, do what we say we're going to do, let alone what that promotion might need us to do. It's entitlement. That's where it comes from. The first you see entitlement, strong desire, entitlement, status and recognition, fairness. Equity is from the devil, by the way. The idea of equity is from the devil. It's not from the Bible. Right? It's just not. Equality is the Bible. We're all created equal is the Bible, right? But equity, we, we still have to, we make decisions that cause our life to be more or less equitable with others. Does that make sense? It's just life, right? Mammon, this is a big one for men. Mammon, looking at everything you have as your own. Looking at everything you have as your own. It's a love of money. It's putting stuff above God, putting, you know, your job above God, right? Putting football before God, unless you're a Hogs fan this year, I hear. I think they're doing good. 
I think Drew, I think Drew got an exemption. You know, like the COVID exemptions? I think he got a spiritual exemption. Where is he at? Oh, he's, he's getting breakfast burritos for you guys. He's going to make sure you have a Rudy's taco when you leave. <laughs> Finally, we have uh, the pride of life. And I'm going to finish like seven minutes early. You guys are welcome. The pride of life is that sinful temptation for excess greatness or power that we feel this constant temptation to attain. I think pride of life is actually seen most in men. I think it's most in men. I do. Pride itself is one of the sins that the Bible says God hates the most. The Bible actually says that God will literally resist you with that spirit. Some examples of this sin exclude excess or undue esteem, trying to make a name for yourself to be seen by others. I see this in the church a lot. I can't tell how many people have wanted to write a big check to this church so they can put their name on something, which I don't actually think is bad. We might be selling bricks one day here. I'm not saying that's bad. But if that's your number one motive is, man, I just want to do it to be seen by others, that's a problem. That's a problem. Self-righteousness, we're better than others. Isn't it interesting how when we master a sin in our life, we turn and judge others who haven't mastered it yet? We do that all the time. I, I, I'll tell this story. I was a, uh, man, I was just getting started. Kyle and I are probably married for five minutes. We just celebrated 17 years this last June. And uh, I remember I was riding around with a pastor. We had just moved to St. Louis to help him start a church. We were driving around in downtown St. Louis and there was a panhandler on the side of the road. It looked like a rough guy. You know, not like, the, not like the guys that are wearing Toms and skinny jeans now, you know. But like, this guy looked like he had been through some stuff. And he was, he was panhandling at the end and I said something that you know, many people say because they're jerks. Oh, you know, I'd, I'd help him, but he'd probably just go blow, blow the money on booze. My pastor didn't say anything. We're just driving. I notice he turns all the way around the block. City blocks are really big in St. Louis. I mean, it took forever. We come all the way back around to that very same panhandler. He hands him a $100 bill and says, I'm praying for you. Rolls up the window and we drive. About three miles later, I muster up the courage to ask him about the lesson. Like, you know, I, it was kind of like, I'm sorry. I, obviously, I misread something. He goes, no, you didn't misread anything. He goes, maybe that's what that guy's going to do. He said, but Stephen, don't you ever forget. And I try to never forget this. Had it not been for God's grace, I would be on that corner. And I think sometimes we can become so self-righteous and church people can be the worst that we overcome an addiction to alcohol or sex or pornography or, or st- whatever it is. And then we turn and we're the harshest critic, the meanest people. You know, the Bible says that the stronger should be the one that restores people. And the word strong there is strength under control. You know what a Bible man is? A man who uses his strength to lift his brothers up, to lift culture up, to lift others up, even when they don't even deserve it. Because last I checked, Everything above hell is by God's grace. Self-righteousness is a big one. Power to lord it over others. I want to be in a position so I don't have to mop the floor anymore. It's not all bad. Okay, you don't want to be digging ditches when you're 80, okay? I get it. But this idea that we want power so we don't have to do all the things other people do. And then there's pride. There's pride. Look at your life. Are you always the teacher but never the student? You know? Always, can you, can you learn from something from everyone, even the jack wagons? That's what we call jack in my town. My wife said I could say that around the kids. So, you know, even the ones that are just like, you can learn something from people. You know, you can. So that's a big list. The big idea, though, is how do you know you're growing in character? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you some real practicals that are going to kind of spin us off into the next meeting and so some of our discussion as well. Proverbs 4.23. How do you know you're growing? This is how. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Part one of that book you're holding is really the foundation, right? It's really uh, part one and part two are really two sides of the personal growth coin. And the first three chapters talk to you about how you, you kind of do this. What's the system in it? And I'm going to give you this, and then you're going to read about it a little bit, right? But how do I guard my heart and grow in my character? The first thing is you've got to surrender your life to Christ. 
You need a new heart. And if you don't have a new heart, you need to surrender your life to Christ. Talk to one of us. We'll pray with you to do that. We'll give you some resources to help you grow. But you know, you don't just surrender your heart to Christ once as a Christian. I mean, I've surrendered my heart to Christ two or three times just this morning. You you continue to do that. You continue to say, you know what, Lord, you have me exactly where you want me. There's something I can learn and grow in. I'm going to give up the things I can't control. It's a big one for men. You know why? You know, Facebook would go away. We would just have cat memes and family pictures. If we took all the people off that were trying to control what is impossible for them to control, they'd stop complaining about stuff that doesn't matter, that they can't fix, and they'd start actually looking at their own life and saying, hey, God, what are you calling me to do right where I'm at? What's the next right thing? I'm not going to be bogged down by the the last bad thing. I'm going to look forward to the next right thing. The next is you've got to learn to think like God. This is a big one. This is a big one. How you think doesn't work. All right? How God thinks, his word always works. Always works. You've got to learn to think about God. You've got to have a new mind. I talk about that in chapter two. You've got to hold God's word over your head and allow it to be a filter for how you think, no matter how much you want it. And then when you're confronted with ways that you think that don't line up with God's word, you have to go back to number one. And surrender it. And give it up. And, and you know what's cool about God? All of his ways actually work. If you'll just work them. All right? Step out in faith. Do it. And I promise you, God will prove to you that it was the best way to do it. And then finally, you're going to need to learn to ask the Holy Spirit for help. You're going to need a new power. Willpower, guys, listen. Willpower is not, is not going to result in lasting change in your life. I'm going to teach you a bunch of other stuff, too. We have some fun plans. This is like kind of the, the foundation one. I'm going to talk to you about personal vision next month. Next month, we're going to talk about how you can actually map out. And, you know, and it's, it's a fun process. So, you know, you have form. You have some stuff you can, you can really look at. None of that stuff matters, though, if the foundation of your life isn't in order. None of that matters if you're not constantly surrendering your life to Christ. If you're not constantly in God's word, around God's people. We're going to talk a lot about shared faith in the back half um, of our time over the next eight months. And then ultimately, we need to ask the Holy Spirit for help. Did you know Jesus, when he was teaching us to pray, told us to pray, God, keep me from temptation. God, just keep me from temptation. Not just give me strength to overcome it, but Lord, keep me from it. I can't tell you how many times I hear a story that one of my friends went through and I think to myself, I would be in jail if I was there. Have you ever think that? I think, man, if, that, if I was confronted with that, I would probably be in jail right now. And I think to myself, thank you, God, for keeping me from temptation. <laughs> I thank you, Lord, that I get to hear their story because they were more patient and they, did, they, they reacted differently than I would have. Does that make sense? You know, we have to act, actively ask the Holy Spirit, God, protect us as we walk. Man, I am really excited. I'm excited about what this is going to mean for not just the men of our church, but for your guests, for the people who are going to come to know Christ. Uh, I pray that this room gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, But, you know, it's not so much about the big room. It's about how big are the men in the room. You know, I I think think God's going to continue to grow his church, but I think he can grow it exponentially if we stop caring about big churches and we start caring about building big people. That's really what this whole environment's about. So I, I, I pray that you'll commit. I know you're going to hear as we leave some slides about the next meeting. Uh, we're going to open up registration for that. The giveaways are going to get better. The food's going to get better. Everything's going to get better. Uh, but we're going to get better. Does that make sense? We're going to grow as well. Let me pray for you, and then I'm going to put you off to a time of reflection. And for some of you guys that have never done this, uh, many of us as men, we're not very comfortable just sitting still. Uh, unless you're an introvert, I love it. But uh, just sitting still. All right, and thinking about what we just learned, looking back through our notes and actually writing something down, right? I'm gonna give you a time to do that and then I'm gonna just encourage you in our group discussion time, it doesn't have to go super long, just go around the table, limit yourself. If you're a talker, talk less. If you're not a talker, talk more, okay? You guys will meet in the middle, two to four minutes, just to kind of go, hey, this is kind of what I got from it and then we'll, we'll dismiss and go about our day, okay? All right, let me pray for you first and then we'll get into that reflection time. God, I thank you so much, Lord, for each and every one of these men. I thank you, God, for what you're going to do in and through us uh, in this time, in this season where we just make a space and place to just learn more about you, connect with other godly men who share values that we value. I pray, God, that you would continue to grow us, 
that God, uh, that as our lives move closer to you, Father, and as we move closer to healthier relationships and men in our life, God, everything connected to our life would get better. I pray, God, by your Holy Spirit, you would continue to empower every single man here. I thank you, Father, that even over the next breakfast that we have and the next events that we have going through uh, the winter and the spring, God, I pray that you would continue to protect and grow uh, this group of men. We truly are stronger together. Iron sharpens iron. Being forged is a process. And I pray, God, that we would commit to that process together. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. All right, y'all get to writing a little bit and then we'll talk about it.